Good morning, everyone. I hope you had a good weekend. Uh, we are going to get started. Very busy today. A lot of things to uh, go through. Uh, we'll wrap up what we um, did on Friday, on last Thursday, actually. We'll wrap up the lecture one. Uh, just a couple more slides to go, and then we're going to go ahead and start on um, lecture two. Uh, and then there are a couple of things I need to tell you about uh, what's going on next week. Um, we'll do that when more people get here. All right. So uh, we last class, we learned about the importance of in, in, in including a placebo, right, which is uh, a sham treatment. Um, it's not really going to affect the result of the um, experiment, but we're including a placebo. Um, so that we can eliminate bias from uh, the participant um, as well as the researcher, right? Um, so these graphs are important to go through and make sure you have a good understanding of it. Now, um, another thing we need to um, consider when we are conducting um, experiment is sample size. Right? You want to have um, uh, uh, a large enough sample size so that your results are uh, more accurate. Right? The, the bigger it is, the more reliable your results are going to be. Right? A scientific study that involves only like four or five people, that's not really representative of the entire population. Right? So um, especially when it comes to like testing new drugs, new vaccines, right? you really need to have you know, thousands and sometimes millions of people um, who are involved in the, in, in the trial. And when you are selecting individuals from the population, it's important to um, do a randomized selection. Okay? Uh, you wanna include people from a variety of, um, of, of background, unless your study is specifically tailored to a specific age group, for example, or a specific ethnic background uh, or, or a specific gender. But otherwise, generally, you want to randomize your selection uh, in most cases. Other things that needs to be considered when we are conducting um, experiments that involves human, uh, other ethical issues would be, um, uh, 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 for example, the type of testing. Okay? What, what are we going to be um, uh, uh, using? Oops, sorry. What are we going to be uh, 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 using as a, as a, as our testing method? Um, we talk about how, um, in many cases, we 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 need to include uh, a placebo, right? Um, we have to have a um, a control group, a placebo group as well as a treatment group. That's kind of like a gold standard, but there are situations where that might not be necessarily the best um, uh, course of action. And you might remember um, there was an Ebola outbreak um, that happened not too long ago, like five, six years ago uh, in, uh, in Sierra Leone. And a lot of people were dying and, and you know they didn't have a vaccine at the time, uh, but there were a couple of contenders, right? So they want to do, uh, a few tests of those vaccines to see if it works or not. So people are, um, who are uh, uh, conducting the experiment are like, we're going to have a placebo group. But then there are other uh, groups such as you know, Doctors Without Borders. They, they were saying it's not ethical in this particular case to include a placebo, right? Because people are dying um, and they are in urgent need of some kind of medical care. So if you have a vaccine that has shown promising results from early stages of testing on animals, for example, it's not ethical to withhold a potential life-saving vaccine uh, from people, right? So like, it, it would be unfortunate for someone to be assigned to the placebo group, okay? So they receive something um, which is not gonna do anything for them because it's a placebo. Uh, on the other hand, we have something that potentially could help them uh, to protect them, right? So it's, it's not ethical to deprive them of the uh, of the you know potential life saving vaccine, so that that's the kind of ethical arguments that people uh, debate about uh, in these uh, situations. Uh, who should participate? Right? Should we uh, 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 do the testing on frontline workers, right, or should we be doing it on a randomized trial, right? Uh, you know, those are also important things. And the last point is when to mass produce. Um, when it comes to vaccine uh, production, like if it's not like an urgent situation, right, if you're just like developing a vaccine uh, or, or any new medications, right? The general 
uh, consensus is you don't you don't mass produce the drug or vaccine until you know it works, right? From a financial standpoint, that's understandable, right? Pharmaceutical company don't want to invest all this money to mass produce the vaccines only to find out in the end that you know what actually it it doesn't quite work, right? So. Um, but in the case of, say, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, right, pharmaceutical company were told to, you know what, let's get the infrastructure uh, in place and start scaling up your production uh, uh, early on, even though we don't know 100% if it's going to work or not. Okay, If it turns out that it works, fantastic. You already have the capacity. You already are ahead of the game. You're producing these vaccines, right? Um, and that's the ideal scenario. And if it turns out it doesn't work, you know what, that's okay. The government's going to absorb the cost and you're not going to take a financial hit uh, for it, right? So uh, uh, that's why they were able to push out the vaccine uh, faster than uh, those that were done traditionally. Uh, conflict of interest, right? We, 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 we talk about this already. Uh, sometimes, you know, some um, uh, uh, companies, right? Or, or, or industry, they have uh, uh, invested interest um, to not have certain negative results that are published about their industry. So one um, very uh, uh, a good example of this is uh, the sugar industry. Okay, so apparently um, recently it has come to like that a lot of the um, academic literature. Uh, that were published in like the um, uh, 60s, um, they were being paid by the sugar industry to play down the link between sugar and cardiovascular diseases. Okay, and, and they were saying, you know, shift the focus to the uh, to the dietary fat. Okay, blame it on the greasy food, blame it on the lipids. Don't don't tell people sugar is bad, right? Um, and, and, and that, of course, uh, has results on people's choice on what to eat, right? And as we know now, I'm sure you're aware, the excessive intake of sugar uh, in, in our daily uh, diet um, causes a whole bunch of problems, not just cardiovascular disease, but also things like diabetes, obesity, right? Hypertension, all these things are linked to excessive consumption of sugar. And sugar is everywhere, right? Like if you buy anything that is processed, right, there's going to be a load of sugar in it. And, you know, these donuts, um, you know, if you eat like an ice cream bar, a lot of sugar, even things like ketchup, right, um, has a load of sugar in it. Uh, and that um, uh, is an example of conflict of interest, right? Not everything that's published are necessarily good science, right? It depends on um, who was paying for the research, who was funding for the research. Are there any, you know, uh, 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 invested party that has a conflict of interest um, on the topic? So those are the things that we have to uh, pay attention to. There are a couple of other examples. It's not important uh, because of um, time interest. We're going to skip that. Now, there is something called p-hacking. Long story short, when, when people do experiment, okay, um, to determine whether there is a, is a difference uh, between the control group and the experimental group, okay? So like the people who are not receiving treatment versus the people who are receiving treatment to mathematically determine whether there is a difference between the two groups, um, you have to calculate something called a p-value, okay, p-value. It's a, it's a statistical uh, um, analysis, which we're not going to go into. What you need to know is that when the cutoff is generally p is less than 0 0.05, that means there is a, there, I, I am not, when well, you get p equals to 0 0.05, it means you are 95% confidence that the results you got are accurate. That's what it means, okay? So the scientific community has agreed that 95% confidence is good confidence, all right? But for more, um, more uh, stringent tests, okay, things that are more serious, so to speak, right? Um, sometimes they want to have as low as 0 0.01. Okay, so 0 0.05 means you are 95% sure that the experiments are accurate. What about P is 0 0.01? What does that mean? Based on what I explained to you. Can someone tell me what this would mean? How sure are you? 100% sure. 100% sure? Okay. 99. 
99%. Yeah, 99%, right? Because, you know, 100, this, this is 1%, basically, right? So you're 99% sure that your results are accurate. So 99% is pretty accurate, right? You know what I mean? I compared to 95. Okay, so here's the thing. Um, again, long story short, depending on how you make the calculations, sometimes researcher can tweak the math a little bit and then they can manipulate the p-value, okay? They can skew the results so that you get the right p-value, right? So even though when there are no difference between the two groups, between the control group and the treated group, they can change the math um, so that it works towards the outcome that they want, okay? And then they publish the result. All right, so that's called p hacking. It's by the the sometimes it's conscious they do it purposely. Sometimes it's subconscious. Okay, like you 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 are misinterpreting the result. Okay, some things are like borderline and and, and you subconsciously because you want it to work. You subconsciously, you know, shift it one way or the other. Uh, manipulation of large collection of data in a way that creates a desirable p value. Okay, so you know, 0 0.01 or 0 0.05. That's copy hacking. Does anybody have any question about this? Basically, it's bad science. Okay, yeah, go ahead, uh, Nivir. Um, yeah, so what do we understand by like a subconscious? Like, how do it does get shifted by itself? So, like, I have to, I have to calculate the p value, right? I have to put in the numbers. Uh, and the numbers are based on interpretations of either qualitative or quantitative. Well, in this case, if it's number, then it's like quantitative, right? Uh, 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 measurements, right? So when when you examine things like um, symptoms and stuff like that, sometimes it's not very clear cut, right? Like, you know, seven days versus six days, right? That kind of stuff. So like when you when you record your your, your results, right? You can subconsciously be biased. That's why we need to have a double blind experiment, right? So like, if you don't know whether this person received a treatment or not, then you can really subconsciously manipulate the, uh, the data. Um, you know, that's a, that's a really big topic. Uh, um, you know, we can go on and on talking about it. But basically what you need to know is that the p-value, which is how you determine whether or not your experiment worked or not, basically, okay? Um, and um, people sometimes manipulate that um, there is an excellent excellent example that you can look at uh, over here um, and, uh, and and it will give you more of a background story okay basically it's like cherry picking your results that's what p, p hacking is there's a quick question in the chat if you were to ask what the purpose of a placebo group is during a drug trial my answer would be to compare the drug's actual effectiveness with the effectiveness of the placebo effect would this give me full marks on the test. Okay, if I ask you what a placebo is, a placebo is uh, a, a sham treatment. That's what you have to say. Um, its purpose is to eliminate psychological effect and bias. Okay? And then you can say the placebo has no known effect on the dependent variable. All right, that's what you have to say. Uh, if you need to hear that again, uh, watch the recording. And it should be at the 15 minute mark. That that's when I just said that statement. All right. I hope that helps. Uh, other consideration. Correlation does not necessarily mean direct relationship. Two things can be correlated, but it doesn't mean one causes the other, right? So uh, here we have a percentage of subjects with calls, number of people who are getting cold. Uh, and here we have what's called like the psychological stress index. And uh, from this graph, it looks like people who are more stressed out, or at least they uh, appear to be more stressed out on the index, tends to get more cold, right? And one might conclude that stress causes cold, right? However, this is a correlation, right? We cannot necessarily say that one causes the other because behind the stress, there are many other factors. Maybe you're stressed out because you have other illnesses. Okay? Maybe you are not eating properly. Maybe you don't exercise a lot. Maybe you don't have enough sleep. All these things could cause you to become high stress. right? And, and one of these things might be 
directly related to getting a call, right? So just because you see a correlation, do not immediately assume uh, one is causing, causing the other, okay? There is a website here, you can click on it. It's called uh, Spurious Correlation. It shows like random things that are 100% not related to each other and yet they have perfect correlations. It's pretty funny. Um, interesting, I should say, not, not necessarily funny. But uh, here, right, the, um, the red line uh, shows the amount of cheese that is being consumed, okay? So over the years, this is the number of people who have consumed the number of cheeses. Um, in, uh, I forgot where, maybe the US or something. And then here, uh, it shows the number of deaths uh, because of bed sheet entanglements. People actually do die from being tangled by their own bed sheets. And if we put the two graphs together, you see that they have very, very uh, much alike, right? So does eating more cheese makes you more likely to get tangled and die from, you know, uh, uh, from, from your bed sheet? Probably not, right? Very likely not. But yet they have very similar uh, pattern. So this this just illustrates my point, right? Just because two things appear to be um, correlated, right, does not mean they have a cause and effect relationship. Okay, correlation does not imply causality. That's the key thing to remember. Um. And you know the the whole thing that we are trying to uh, talk about in this uh, unit is you know um, to evaluate things critically, right? To, when when you read these headlines, there's a lot of like uh, clickbaits, right? You look at a flashy headlines, you know, um, and then you click on it, and then people believe what they say on the internet, like without filter, right? So that's that's not a good thing, right? So when you see things like this, right, you sh we should keep in mind the scientific process and we should evaluate the things uh, critically. I'm sure like a lot of you here drink coffee, right? It's drinking coffee good for you or bad for you? I just did a quick search, right? Between uh, February, um, April uh, 2016, that's like the, uh, the time frame that I put in the Google search. And I just look for, you know, studies on coffee, like on Google. Um, and then I found like conflicting stuff, right? Drinking more coffee might reverse liver damage from booze. Okay, so that's like, oh, okay, maybe drinking coffee is good if you happen to drink a lot of uh, alcohol as well. Uh, and then here, cons uh, coffee consumption may help prevent colon cancer. So that's another good thing. And then here, uh, coffee consumption in either parents, you know, male, dad or mom, may raise miscarriage risk. And then here, drinking coffee may cut your risk of developing endometrial cancer, studies suggest. So, you know, there's so many things and, and, and all these things are just correlation maybe, right? Maybe it has nothing to do with the coffee, right? Maybe, maybe you know, people who like to drink coffee actually, I don't know what else they do, but maybe, maybe some other thing that they do, right? And that's what I mean, right? When you compare all these uh, different aspects, let's say you have like, you know, um, uh, 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 a coffee consumption on one hand as one variable, and then you have 10 other variables. So if you compare uh, coffee consumption with liver damage, and then you calculate the p-value, let's say you found no difference. Okay, then you take coffee consumption and then compare it to like colon cancer, and you calculate the p-value, and then let's say you find no difference. And then you go cancer compared to like uh, you know, lung cancer, let's try lung cancer. And then you find no correlation. And then you move on to the next one. And you keep on doing this until you find, oh, okay, uh, coffee consumption and uh, how long you live. Oh, I find a, I find a p-value that actually is less than 0 0.01. Then coffee consumption must extend your life. That's called p-hacking, right? You are manipulating the data. You're cherry picking the results, right? You're not looking at the pic picture. You're just looking at one specific aspect until the data fits what you want to present, right? So that's copy hacking, right? And, and you know, just because the math shows you that the, the results are significant does not automatically mean it's meaningful, right? Okay, it could sometimes just be, remember you're only 99% um, uh, sure, right? So if you do it often enough, if you compare coffee to say like, a hundred different variables, there is a 1% chance eventually you're going to hit something that means nothing, but the math tells you that it means something, 
Okay, so that's called p-hacking, and uh, you know, at best, you get a correlation. It doesn't actually mean anything. So how do we know? How do we know how credible those sources are, right? So we 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 have to um, look at primary sources versus secondary sources. Primary sources are generally uh, more accurate. Okay, these are first-hand information provided by the researchers themselves, the people who've done the experiment themselves, uh, and and they have to write in a report and they have to submit it. These um, reports before they're published are usually uh, not usually they, they have to be they have to be peer review okay so other experts in the field whatever field you're studying has to um have to look at your, your your experiment has to look at your data has to scrutinize it and make sure that they are uh done properly and uh, the results are repeatable um before you can publish the results okay so generally speaking these are more reliable uh Primary sources could also be like a like a interview uh, of a person who's you know telling you about his first hand his or her first hand exp experience. Right, that's a primary source. If if an author is writing down you know his own biography or something, that's an example of a primary source. It comes directly from the person who has done something or who has had that experience um, of of an event. Um, that's primary source. Secondary source are like second second hand information. So like uh, you you reading uh, 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 a summary of the actual report. Right. So someone else read that report and then they they um, they write a summary of it and they post it on the internet. That's a secondary source. Okay. Maybe it's accurate. It could be. Uh, but maybe the person leave out um, critical information. Right. That. Uh, that uh, that 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 uh, uh, could change the meaning of the of the results, right? Okay, um, and uh, textbooks are secondary sources. Newspaper sometimes is secondary sources. If if the person who's writing about, it, if the person who's telling you about it is not the person who did the experiment or not the person who has the first hand experience from the event, then it's a secondary source. There's another question. So p hacking is manipulating data to present a favor result as statistically significant. That is beautifully uh, said. Yeah, I couldn't have said it better. Yeah? Uh, so that, that, that basically is the, um, is the essence of what p-hacking is. Okay? So p-hacking is bad science. Okay? It's cherry picking data until it fits. Um, until it fits. You know, have a, let me give you a brief example here of, um, you know, not, not science, but like examples of like a real life scenario where it's similar to p-hacking, okay? Like my daughter, sometimes she, um, you know, she, she would do these, you know, uh, basketball shots that are like impossible shots. And then she wants me to film her, right? So one time she likes, she, she like try to throw the ball uh, um, to the hoot, shoot the ball like backwards without looking at the net. And then she was like, take a video of me. Okay, I was like, fine. Right. So of course she missed right the first time, and then she keeps on doing it, and then she keeps on asking me to keep recording her, and then you know just by complete luck, complete fluke, right? She got it in after trying I don't know like twenty some twenty four times or something, right? She got it, in. and she's like, yes, did she get get that? I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you know she 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 went and showed it to my to my mom, right, to her grandmother, right, and then and like. The, the one where she got it in, right? And then my mom said, wow, she's really good at basketball, right? And then and I'm like, yes, you know, you didn't see the 25 times before, right? She got it in, right? So it's this is cherry picking, right? So just because there is a headline that says, oh, uh, consumption of green tea is going to lower your risk of getting colon cancer, okay? Like, is, is that maybe that gives you a significant p-value Right, but what about the big picture, right? Maybe we didn't see the other twenty-five studies that shows that it didn't, right? Remember, right? Just because look at we cannot look at one specific outcome, one specific result, and then apply it to the general, right? Remember inductive reasoning, right? We have to look at multiple studies, multiple uh, sources, and if they all show the consistent result, then we can generalize. Okay, I guess that's the point I'm trying to make. Uh, excuse me, Professor. Yeah. Uh, can we say that um, if it works for one person, it doesn't mean that it works for everybody? 
uh, it works as in like the experiment or you're talking about like the, say the green tea? Like, is that... The green tea, like anything. Okay, so uh, that's something as that's, that's, you know, so even if you have a generalization, right, it, it might not work for specific people. There are exceptions, right? I think that's what you're talking about, right? But, the, but that's not what we are discussing here, right? For the, for the p-value thing, for the um, good science, you should be able to repeat it and you should have comparable results um, from large multiple studies uh, before you can draw a conclusion. Uh, you know, some of you know Dr. Oz, like this he's like celebrity doctor, right? And you know, if you watch his stuff, he, he randomly tells you, you know, uh, take this product, right? It, it's going to, uh, you know, improve your cardiovascular function and all that stuff, right? So he makes a lot of claims, okay? But a lot of his claims are are like not true, right? He he's saying what he's saying because he get paid to do it, right? By these uh, uh you know companies that sells these products, right? In fact, there is um an article in the Washington Post that uh, actually um you know look at all his claims, and it turns out that fifty percent of his care claims are actually baseless uh, or wrong. Right? So like just because someone is wearing like a lab coat, right, and then telling you stuff on on these flashy TV show, don't believe it. That's it for lecture one. All right. Now, uh, I think most of us are here. Um, we're missing like 10 people from the class, but that's okay. They can watch the recordings uh, to, uh, to see what they have missed. But I really want to tell you what's going on next week because it's a little bit confusing, okay? Uh, uh, in, the, in, the next, in the next class and the next week. So today, right, we still have about hour and a half. Um, we probably need to skip the break um, to catch up a little bit, but we will start on lecture two, macromolecules. Okay, macromolecules is quite long. Uh, we have um, how, how many slides do we have? We have 106 slides. Right? So there's no way we're going to be able to finish it today. We do as much as we can, uh, and for Wednesday we're going to have asynchronous learning. Okay, that means you're not going to come to Zoom class. I have another. Um, obligation that I have to attend to. So we, we won't be having a Zoom class on Wednesday. I will post a recording of the rest of the lecture. Okay, so whatever we finish here, all right, fine. The rest of the lecture, you will watch a recording of it. Does that make sense? You're not gonna come to class on Wednesday. And then next Monday, the college is closed because of Victoria Day, it's long weekend. So there's also no class. All right, so after today, the next time we will see each other face to face is May 24th on the Wednesday. All right. And on that day, you will also have the first quiz. First quiz will be on lecture one as well as lecture two. You don't necessarily do the quiz during the Zoom time, right? Okay, our Zoom meet is 8:30 to 10 20 okay in fact you shouldn't be doing the quiz while we're meeting right because you will miss the class right okay the quiz is available from 6 a.m in the morning all the way until midnight until 11 59 p.m so you have the whole day to access the quiz once you start the quiz though the timer will not stop right so you will have 45 minutes to finish the quiz Okay, so make sure that you are in a in a quiet place with no interruption. The quiz, which I will post all these information later, will have two short answer questions. You have to type your answers. Uh, one is two marks, one is four marks, I think. And uh, there will be 17 multiple choice questions, regular kind of multiple choice questions. You can do the uh, practice quiz on eCentennial to, you know, see how much you know. Um, and then there will be five multi-select questions. These are questions that have more than one correct answers. Okay, so two short answers, 17 standard multiple choice questions, five multi-select questions. Um, and this is going to be 10% of your final grade, and it's going to be happening on May 24th. Okay, and I just want to remind you, we will have class on May 24th as well. So please plan to come uh, accordingly. Next class, watch the recordings, and then Monday, no class. Does anybody have any question before I do the lecture? Uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. 
do we need to provide the camera for the exam? No. Okay. So like for the for the quiz, right? Uh, it's different from your other class. Okay. So in your other classes, you might have to turn on your camera. In your other classes, you might have to do, use this thing called the lockdown browser. For me, it's very straightforward. Okay. I will have a link on eCentennial. You will click on the link and it will take you to the quiz uh, directly. Okay. So, you know, when I post announcement, you have, you see these blue things, right? Okay. Th those are hyperlinks. You click on it, it'll take you to the quiz. So on, when I post the announcement um, later today, probably uh, uh, there will be a link. And when, when, when you click on it, it will take you, it will take you directly to the quiz. Okay. Um, but if you can't find it, you can, you can go to assessment quiz and then uh, you will see quiz one here. Okay, like you won't be able to do it now. It's not going to be available until May 24th, right? Again, from six to uh, midnight, right? Does, does that make sense? Uh, the recordings, I haven't, sorry, uh, Takiri, are you, are you talking about the recordings for lecture two or the recordings of the previous lessons? The previous lessons, okay. So if you miss the previous uh, uh, class uh, recording, here, every time after class, I would say recording archive has been updated. So you just click on the recording archive. You just click directly on the link and it will take you to this uh, page. Take some time to load. Okay. And uh, you will just click on it. Okay. You just click on it. All right. And you can bookmark this page because that's where I will post the recordings. Uh, 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 um, every time, okay, and um, and so I, after today's class, I'll post this recording, and then I'll post the recording for the rest of the lecture, so you can you can watch it, um, you know, on on Wednesday. Are, are we together? Anyone else have any questions? Uh, where we can see the practice questions? Practice quizzes. Okay, so like, um, if you go to the question page. Assessment, assessment, quizzes, and then here. Okay. You can just go um, click on it. Like th this is the teacher's view. It's different than yours, but for, for you, you, you will be able to do the quiz. You click on it, it, it will say, you know, start the quiz or something. Let me see if I can show you. Yeah, you will see, you get this page and then you just click start quiz. Okay, and then there are some questions here. Now, so that's an example of like a multi-select question, right? So you have to choose more than one answer. If you if you choose extra answer, you will you will lose marks, right? Um, they are two marks each on the actual quiz. All right. Are we um, okay? Anything else? And just another question, Professor. So for the multi-select option, how yeah. many can we choose? Like a two or three? We don't know, right? Each question is different. Sometimes there are two, sometimes it's four, sometimes it's all of them, sometimes it's none of them. So that's why they are they are difficult, right? Okay. But you, um, you know, you only get you only have like five of them on the first on the first quiz. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh is the practice quiz also having a limited time or no I practice quiz you can I, I don't like yeah, two hours, but there are only eight 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 questions, right? Okay. Um these questions are not necessarily you know, just be, my, my point is just because you get perfect on the uh, on the practice quiz doesn't necessarily mean you will do very well on the actual quiz. Right? The actual quiz questions are a little bit um, more difficult sometimes. Right. So these are just a good place to start to see how much, you know. All right. And you can do them many times. OK, as many times as you want. All right. Uh, of course, you can email me if you have any uh, uh, additional questions. Okay, I I am available. Uh, uh, you know, just just because we don't have face to face class, you can still reach me through email. All right, we will start on lecture two. I hope you have your uh, PowerPoint slides with you. So um, we are talking about macromolecules today. And I'll slow down a little bit now. Um, 
because we're rushing through a little bit with the lecture one stuff. Uh, macromolecules means really big molecules, right? When, when we have water molecule, that's H2O, that's three molecules, uh, three atoms rather. Um, but macromolecules are really, really big, thousands of atoms in some cases. Before we do the macromolecules, we need to start with some basic chemistry concept. Uh, I have, there's a question in the chat. Would you put this new lesson in a different recording? No, no, no. The whole Zoom thing is just going to be one chunk, okay? If you just want to be watched lecture two, uh, then it starts at the uh, 35 minute mark, right? I think. Okay, so I know you had a, your chemistry class already, um, you know, two classes of it. So maybe some of this stuff is revision. Um, if not, that's okay as well. So introductory to chemistry. These are chemical con chemistry concepts that we need for understanding macromolecules. Matter, what is matter? Matter is anything that takes up space and has mass. So it has volume and it weighs something. It can be solid, liquid, or gas. And of course they can change from one state to another state by uh, absorbing heat or releasing heat. All the matters that exist in the world, in the universe, as far as we know, are composed of elements, okay? Composed of elements, which are things, substances, that cannot be broken down into other substances, okay? So like chemically, they cannot be further broken down. That's what elements are. Now, the elements themselves are made up of atoms. Okay? So atom is the smallest unit of an element. And it will have the same chemical and physical property as the element. So let's say we take the element carbon, right? carbon. All the carbon atoms would have the same chemical properties as well as physical property, property as the entire chunk of, at, uh, of, of carbon. Okay? Individually, each atom retains that property. The atom themselves are made up of subatomic particles. Right? So there is usually a central place with, um, uh, in, 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 the, in the center, that's called a nucleus. And the nucleus is made up of neutrons, which have no charge, as well as protons, which have positive charge. Okay, P for protons, P for positive. Okay, so that the, together, the protons and the neutrons, they make up the nucleus. And uh, circling around the nucleus are going to be these electrons. Electrons are negatively charged. Zumana, do you have a question? I see you unmute your mic. No. Oh, no? Okay. All right. Uh, all right. So uh, nucleus in the center, electrons like zipping around um, uh, the nucleus. All the elements that exist that we have discovered so far uh, are listed on a periodic table, okay? So, you know, uh, we have things that we are um, aware of, like hydrogen, we know, we know what that is, right? Uh, oxygen, which we need to breathe. Carbon is what we are made up of primarily. Uh, and, uh, you know, you would have, car diamond is carbon, for example, right? Like uh, uh, charcoal, that's carbon. Right. So there's a, a lot of things that we're familiar with. And then there are some that are kind of weird, right? Like some th that we have never heard of uh, before, right? Um, that are listed on the periodic table. But the point is all of these are elements. All these things are uh, the basic building block that makes up everything that we know. Of the hundred something elements that are on the periodic table, over 96% of the human body is made up of just five elements, okay? Carbon, nitrogen, 
oxygen, hydrogen, and phosphorus. Okay. So I already told you, we, we know what carbon is, right? Nitrogen, actually, you know, 70% of the air that we breathe is nitrogen. Okay. We can use those nitrogen though. Okay. We breathe it in and then we pretty much breathe it out. Um, you know, some, sometimes you, you, your, your tires, car tires might be, might be uh, filled with nitrogen gas, right? Um, oxygen, we know what that is. Hydrogen, right? You know, those um, balloons, right? They are helium now, but, you know, sometimes in the past they are hydrogen balloons that float. Um, but hydrogen is very explosive, right? Um, so that's why they change it to helium. Uh, the sun is made of hydrogen, of course. Phosphorus, anybody know? Like uh, everyday life, where do we find phosphorus? You might have some in your kitchen, maybe. Salt, banana. Sorry, what? Salt. Oh, but banana, did you say? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we're going to come back to that point later. Actually, that's an interesting point. Um, in walnuts? I'm not talking about food though, guys. Okay, like, um, because in the, in the food is not like actual elemental phosphorus, okay? You cannot consume elemental phosphorus. The, the, yes, thank you, uh, Tash. Uh, that's the right answer. Uh, match strikers, okay? Um, the phosphorus is what allows the match to light up. Okay, interesting. Uh, but like you, you cannot like consume those, right? So like in the bananas, in the walnuts or whatever food you're thinking about, the phosphorus actually exists in some other form, which we will talk about uh, shortly, okay? For the same uh, uh, thing, right? When we say we have hydrogen, right? We are not suggesting that it's existing as as a gas, right, in our body, right? Um, it's often combined with something else. In any case, uh, ninety six percent of the human body is made up of just five of these things, and then the rest of it, the four percent, right, uh, are made up of what's called trace elements. Right? Trace elements are elements that are only needed, only require, in very very small amount. Okay. If you have too much of it, it could lead to toxicity. Okay. Uh, and, and if you don't have enough of it, that could also cause some problems. So you just need to have the right amount of these trace elements. Example of trace elements that you might know, that you might have heard of, includes zinc. Right? Zinc is related to your immune system. Right? So we need that. Um, calcium, I'm sure you know, we need calcium for the bones as well as for uh, moving your muscle. Every time you move the muscle, you need to have the calcium. And please be, I know this is very hard to wrap your head around uh, for some people. When we say calcium, we don't mean elemental calcium, like CA, right? Well, it, it exists in ion forms usually, which we'll get into um, in a bit. But just keep that in mind. I don't mean like a chunk of calcium in our bones. That, that's not what it means. Iodine, right? Uh, iodine is, is uh, used by your thyroid. Your thyroid is right here. And uh, it uses iodine to make two hormones. Right? They're called T3 and T4, which helps regulate your metabolism. Um, there's a question. So milk has the ion version of calcium. Yes, that's correct. Um, we're going to get back to that in a second. Magnesium, we need it also for muscle contraction. Okay. Does anybody have another example of a trace element that may, that, you know, that they could think of that you heard people say you need and then what it's needed for? Just want to throw it out there, see what you think. I have one other example in mind. If I say it, you, you, you will for certain have heard of it. And. That's right, iron. That is the exact one I was thinking about, right? We need iron, right, for uh, for our uh, our blood cells, right, so that we can transport oxygen. People who don't have enough iron, right, uh, they have anemia, right? Iron deficiency anemia. They cannot uh, distribute oxygen efficiently. Okay, so there are many, many traces, uh, trace elements, right? Potassium, right? Chloride, all those things. Here, if a person has iodine deficiency, if they don't get enough iodine, then um, their uh, thyroid gland, the one that uses iodine to make the hormone, it gets big, okay? And some people uh, probably have seen this uh, before. Uh, it's called goiter, right? Because we don't have enough iodine to make the hormone, 
the thyroid gland tries to get bigger uh, uh, to compensate. Right? If, if your body believes if the thyroid gets bigger, then now it can make more of the hormone. But that's not the problem. Right? The problem is you don't have the raw material, right? Okay. Uh, in Canada, um, we don't have to worry about iodine deficiency uh, because it's in all our salt. Right? The table salt that you buy from the store, they are iodinized. Um, they have iodine in. And the reason is to prevent iodine deficiency. Natural sources of iodine would be like, you know, seafood. They have a lot of, uh, of iodine in it, right? Um, seaweed, that kind of stuff, right? Rich in iodine. But again, like we, we, we don't have to worry about it. Uh, calcium deficiency, I'm sure you're aware. Um, if you don't have enough calcium, that could weaken your bones, right? This, these are your bones and then it becomes very, very porous. A lot of holes in it. Um, that's called osteoporosis osteoporosis okay too much is not good either too much calcium anybody know what happens if you have too much calcium if you take too many supplements of calcium what what is a uh, one possible side effect it can um lead to osteoporosis oh sorry no it can actually give you um too much can give you um uh, kidney stones. Yeah, exactly. That that is perfect. Right? Too much calcium, your body's trying to kind of filter it, try to you know try to get rid of it from uh, from your pee. But then if you have too much calcium, those calcium starts to um, uh, uh, deposit in your kidney, and then you know you might get cal uh, uh, a kidney stone. Right. It's the same thing as uh, your water kettle. Right. If you don't have a water softener at home, and most of us don't, I don't, uh, then your kettle eventually has the calcium deposit, right? The, um, from the hot water, right? So like we have to add vinegar to get rid of it, right? Exactly the same thing is gonna happen to your body if you have too much calcium. All right, moving on. Um, there is something called isotopes, okay? Isotopes are atoms of the same element, but with different number of neutrons, okay? So when we look at the periodic table, I don't know, I don't know if you guys have a periodic table uh, handy here, uh, but you know, if you look up carbon, carbon is going to be number 12 on the periodic table. So we call it carbon, carbon 12, okay? So that's like the most common one, okay? Carbon 12 has six protons and six neutrons. Uh, so, you know, that gives it a mass of 12, right? So all the carbon atoms in the whole world, all of the carbon atoms are going to have six protons. Protons do not change. Okay? If you add protons, then it becomes a different element. Let me show you on the periodic table, right? So carbon, it's carbon number, did I say 12? I mean, uh, carbon number six, okay? Carbon number six, sorry. Uh, but it has a mass of 12. So if you add a proton to it, then it will become nitrogen. If you take a proton away, then it becomes boron, right? So the number of protons does not change, right? So carbon-12 has six protons. All the carbons have six protons, but the number of neutrons might be different, right? Sometimes you might have an extra neutron, right? Then it will become carbon-13. Right, which will have six protons. Protons don't change, but now there will be seven neutrons. And you can have carbon-14, which also has six protons, okay? and then now it will have eight neutrons. You don't have to know how to calculate the number of neutrons. Your chemistry teacher will teach you that. My point is some atoms of the same kind of element are heavier than others. We call them isotopes. Okay. So there are different kinds of isotopes. Some isotopes are stable, right? They don't break down. Other, they are um, unstable, and then they naturally break down. And, and sometimes they can even give off radiation. So we call them radioactive isotopes. So uh, some use of these isotopes, carbon-14 uh, can be used to date a skeleton. Yeah, if, you, if you dig up a fossil, either of a human or of some kind of animal, you can check to see how much carbon-14 is left in the bones, then you would be able to work out how old it is. 
we continuously take in carbon-14 from the atmosphere, okay? When we breathe right in and we breathe out, when we eat food and stuff like that. As soon as we die, we stop taking in carbon-14. So whatever amount of carbon-14 you had when you die stays in the body and then they slowly break down, right? So by seeing how much is left in the bones, right? We can work backwards to see, you know, when does the, the person die? When did the person die? When did the animal die, okay? Iodine 131, that is a uh, radioactive um, iodine. Yeah, people who have thyroid cancer would be administered radioactive iodine. The iodine would go directly to the thyroid because that's the only place your body uses it. And then they will break down in the, uh, in the thyroid. As they break down, they give off radiation. The radiation will kill the cancer cells in the thyroid. Uh, you should have a smoke detector at home, right? By law, um, you... Sorry, Professor, can you please um, explain again about the iodine thing? Sure. So iodine-131 is an isotope. It's heavier than the normal version. Um, and when it breaks down, it gives off radiation, okay? So people who have thyroid cancer, <laughs> uh, they would be administer... Um, they will be administered the radioactive iodine. The iodine will travel to their thyroid. And as they break down, they give off radiation and the radiation will kill off the cancer cell. That's basically what it is. This is a picture of the thyroid, okay? Um, I hope that answers your question. Uh, next, smoke detector, right? We, we have to have a smoke detector at home by law. Um, and in the smoke detector, there is uh, some radioactive... Um, uh, uh, America minute, okay, 241. Uh, and long story short, it, it gives off a little bit of radiation I, uh, and, and, and that creates like um, continuous stream of uh, a current. And, and when the smoke gets into the smoke detector, it disrupts that current and then it sets off another uh, circuit to, to give off the, uh, uh, the alarm, okay? Um, but there is a little bit of radioactive uh, isotopes in your smoke detector. Uh, it's perfectly safe though, okay? Like it's not gonna give you any kind of, you know, adverse health effect. Uh, two questions in the chat. Can isotopes have less than regular amount of neutrons? Yep, there uh, is like carbon 11, for example, um, but those tends to be uh, unstable and they break off very, very quickly. And then there is another question. So does neutrons add weight? Absolutely, the more neutrons you have, the heavier is going to be. Right. The key takeaway from this slide is protons, number of protons don't change. Number of neutrons can be more or less. Okay. And then you create these different isotopes. Some isotopes are radioactive. Okay. They give off radiation, such as the iodine 131, americum 241. All right. Next concept is ions. Ions. Ions are atoms of the same element that has different number of electrons, okay? So protons are the same here, neutrons are the same, but the number of electrons are different, okay? So let's say we have a, a, a carbon-12 again, carbon-12. Carbon-12, you know what? Maybe that's not a good example. Let's say we, we, we use a, a sodium, okay? Sodium, Na is sodium. Okay, so uh, on the periodic table, sodium is number 11, number 11. So it has 11 protons, right? Never mind the neutrons. That's not what we're focusing on right now. And then it has 11 electrons. In a neutral atom, the number of protons and number of electrons are always the same. So this is neutral. Okay. But then, sorry, go ahead. Was there a question? No? Okay. So um, what happens is sometimes the atoms will gain electrons. Sometimes they will lose electrons, all right? Um, and the reason behind that, you, your chemistry teacher will tell you. All you have to know for my for the biology stuff is you know, sometimes they gain, sometimes they lose. So you can have the sodium and it will, it will lose an electron. It will give off an electron. And then it will become positively charged. Okay, positively charged. Because right? electrons are, are negative, right? 
So if you lose a negative charge, you become positive. Okay? So we call this cation. On the other hand, something like fluorine, they might pick, or chlorine, let's use chlorine as an example, they will pick up an electron. Because they have an extra electron now, they would become negatively charged. So this is called an anion. All right. So um, whether you gain an electron, gain an electron or lose an electron, you will become ionized. Okay. And when we say all the elements that we, we talk about the trace elements and stuff like that, they exist in the body most of the time as ions, as ions. Okay. When you drink your sport drinks, you look at the back, right? it's mostly water and sugar, but then there are going to be electrolytes as well. And there are going to be potassium. It's going to be uh, magnesium sometimes, chlorine, right? And depending on the label, they might actually put K+. plus. So it's not elemental potassium that you're consuming. Okay? It's the ion form that you're consuming. The calcium that we have from the milk and the almond milk and you know, yogurt, all that stuff, that is also in the ion form, right? Because actually, uh, calcium, like elemental calcium, like solid calcium, that is very reactive, okay? You drop a chunk of calcium into water, it actually explodes, right? If you haven't seen that before, just YouTube it, right? Same thing with sodium. You know, people say, oh, watch your sodium intake, right? When you eat chips, you have sodium. That's not elemental sodium. It's not the solid sodium uh, in its purest form. So solid sodium is also very reactive, okay? You put a chunk of sodium into, uh, into uh, water, it explodes, literally explodes, right? Yeah. Search it on YouTube if you haven't seen that before. So it's elemental form is not what exists in the body. Okay? It's usually in the, uh, in the iron form, or it's going to be combined with something else. So combining with something else, right? Okay, like, what does that mean? Uh, uh, mentos in Coke? Yeah, but not that kind of explosion. Like when I say so sodium in water explosion, I'm talking about like fire, you know, sparks kind of explosion. Right? Look it up on YouTube. Not now, but later. Okay, so um, either exists in uh, ion form or in combination with something else. So how does it work? How do atoms come together to form, you know, uh, to, 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 to exist in, in, in combination with something else? Okay, so it turns out atoms can be combined in fixed proportions to form molecules. Right? So in this example, we have sodium. Sodium is Na, right? So you know, if you if you're able to see it, right? Um, like we can't, we can't see it with naked eyes. We can't even see it with like you know microscope. It's like really, 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 really small. But the the sodium exists as these individual sodium atoms. Sodium atoms. Oh, it's it's already here. Sorry, sodium atoms. So each of these blue balls is a sodium atom. So sodium, like I said, is very explosive. It reacts with moisture. Uh, it's very soft, though. You can cut it with a, with a regular kitchen knife, okay? That's why the guy here is wearing a glove, because the moisture on your hand is enough to set off a reaction with the sodium. You actually have to so store the sodium in oil so that it doesn't react with the moisture in the, uh, in the air. So super reactive, you know, violent explosion if you, if you drop this thing into water. Um, chlorine... Also, very bad stuff. You don't want to keep that, you know, in your in your house, right? Chlorine is poisonous, right? They use chlorine gas to make uh, weapons, right? In uh, in World War II, if you breathe in the the mustard gas, the chlorine gas, it burns all your uh, uh, surface lining, right? Um, uh, and and you suffocate and you die, right? It's a terrible thing. Um, so you know, we we don't want uh, elemental chlorine. Now, just pause for a second. You, some of you might be thinking, but wait, isn't that the stuff you put in the pool, right? Like, don't they say, oh, the, the pool has chlorine in it? Again, back to my point, not the elemental form. Okay? There is no like chlorine gas bubbling in the pool. If there is, that definitely don't swim in it, right? We're talking about the ion form that is in 
the uh, in in the pool. When you say chlorine, that's what we're talking about. Okay, it exists as a as a combination with other things. Um, you know, the bleach, right? Essentially, that's what it is. Which brings back to our point here, right? The sodium, the elemental sodium, explosive stuff. Uh, elemental chlorine, deadly poisonous stuff. However, if you take one sodium and one chlorine and you put them together chemically, you get a compound. You get a compound. And that compound is sodium chloride. Okay? Sodium chloride is table salt. You must have that in your, in your house, right? And sodium chloride is very safe, right? You put it on your fries, it tastes better, right? It's not poisonous and definitely not explosive, right? So when you take two elements and you combine them together, the end result, the compound that you get in the end has very different properties compared to the original elements. They are like completely different things. So the smallest unit of a compound is a molecule. Right? So the sodium chloride is made up of sodium chloride molecules. One part sodium and one part um, chlorine, basically. And another thing to uh, pay attention to is that the idea of fixed proportion. Right? It's a one-to-one -one ratio here. All sodium chloride in the world is going to have one sodium and one chlorine. Same thing, when we say water, H2O, all the water that we consume, like the, the regular water that we consume, is two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen. If you change the ratio, you get something else entirely. Right? If you add an oxygen, now you have H2O2. Does anybody know what H2O2 is? You rub it on your wound if you hurt yourself. You can buy it in a brown bottle at the at the pharmacy. Hydrogen peroxide. That's right, hydrogen peroxide, right? We for sure cannot drink this stuff, right? Okay, so extra oxygen completely changes the property. It becomes something else, all right? If someone tried to sell you H3O, don't drink it, okay? H2O is the real stuff, fixed proportion. I'm going to pause for a second. Does anybody have any questions? All right. Those of you who just joined, like uh, you know, moments ago, uh, there is an important announcement about what's going on with next week, right? So make sure you check, uh, watch the recordings. I'll post this stuff online as well. Uh, just make sure you go look at them uh, so that you don't you don't get confused. All right. Next, when we put the atoms together, when we try to combine them to form the compounds, you can do it in one of two ways. Okay. Um, you can transfer the electron, transfer, transfer electron, sometimes more than one, okay? And then they form a bond. This is called an ionic bond. Okay? You will learn again more about it from your chemistry teacher. Uh, I'm just giving you bare minimum to understand the biology later on. And then you can share electron. Okay, or sometimes share more than one. And that forms a covalent bond. Covalent bond. So ionic bond means transfer of electron. Like sodium, it, it wants to give away an electron. Chlorine wants to pick up an electron. So they make a perfect pair, right? Um, chlorine will gladly take the electron from the sodium and then they form a bond. Right? Over here, the water, right? there is a sharing of electron between the hydrogen and the oxygen. The sharing uh, creates a covalent bond, okay? Please remember these two things as we continue our discussion. So molecules, right? We, 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 we have small molecules and then we have some big ones. Um, the ones that contains carbon atoms, okay, we call them organic molecules, organic molecules. Anything that has carbon in it is considered as organic. Uh, sorry, there's a question. Can I repeat what I say about covalent bonds? Yeah, covalent bonds just means the electrons are being shared. So, you know, the oxygen did not give the electron to the hydrogen or vice versa. They are just sharing it. Okay, so you see in this picture, 
you know, hydrogen, oxygen, they are sharing the, their electrons. So both get to use it. That's basically what it means. So anything that contains carbon is considered as an organic molecule, uh, except for the following three. Okay? So carbon monoxide, that's the poisonous one, okay? Carbon dioxide, that's the one that we produce. Um, it's one of the major greenhouse gases. And then cyanide. Okay? So these are molecules that has carbon atoms in them but we don't consider them as organic. Everything else that has carbon in it is going to be an organic molecule. Right? Don't confuse this definition of organic with organic food. That's like completely different, right? Organic food, uh, it's the way that they're being grown, right? Okay, but, but here is just whether it has carbon in it or not. Many of the uh, organic molecules are biologically important, right? things like Glucose, which we'll talk about. Uh, proteins, these are organic molecules that are found in the body. However, not all organic molecules are found in biological system. Okay, So a lot of uh, organic polymers are used in everyday lives. Okay, Polyester, that's, uh, that's the stuff that uh, you know, makes your windbreaker or something, right? Your jacket coating, right? Methane is another greenhouse gas, CH4, right? Uh, if you use uh, non-stick frying pans, the Teflon, the Teflon is, a, is an organic molecule with carbon connected to fluorine, right? So a lot of organic molecules have nothing to do with the body, okay? But they are still organic. Why? Because they contain carbon atoms. All right, so let's focus on water molecule for a moment. Water molecule is special uh, because it is considered as a polar molecule, polar molecule. In this um, diagram, we see the red circle, that is the oxygen, and then the white circles, um, those are the hydrogen. Right, so water, you know by now, you should know by now, it's H2O, two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen. And then they are sharing their electron, okay? But here is the thing, okay? Even though they are sharing their electrons, the oxygen is pulling the electron towards itself, okay? It's not an equal sharing. They are sharing, but they are not sharing it equal equally. It's like my kids, okay? Like I got them these uh, squish mellow things, right? Like those little doll thing, plush things, okay? And I say, you guys must share, okay? okay? Share. So like the bigger one is like, yeah, I'll share with the younger one. But she's like playing with them more. And she's like hogging it. So even though they're sharing, but they're not equal share, not 50-50, you understand? Yeah. So the oxygen and the hydrogen are sharing the electron, but the oxygen is kind of hogging. It's like my, my older kid, right? Hogging the electron. So that makes the oxygen slightly negative right? because it's pulling the electron towards itself. It gets to use it more than the hydrogen. So within the, uh, the water molecule, the oxygen is slightly negative, and then the hydrogen is slightly positive. So what that means is when you put one water molecule next to the other, the slightly positive hydrogen will be attracted to the slightly positive, um, sorry, the slightly positive hydrogen will be attracted to the slightly negative oxygen, okay? Like tiny magnets, right? So let me draw it out in a different diagram for you. This, this like circle ball thing is a, can be a little bit confusing. Um, so in your study guide, I actually have a question that asks you to draw it, okay? So over here, number four, uh, indicate the polarity of the water molecule below. Okay? So the oxygen is slightly negative. Slightly, we use this symbol. It's like an eight, but not complete. We say delta, so slightly negative, slightly positive, slightly positive. So what does that mean? Well, if I have one water molecule here next to another one, 
the slightly negative oxygen on one will be attracted to the slightly positive one on the other. So there is an interaction right here. Similarly, we can have another water molecule here. Uh, hydrogen is slightly positive, oxygen is slightly negative, and then they would be attracted to each other. So this attraction is called hydrogen bond. I'll give you a moment to copy that. Now, this caused water to stick to each other, right? It's the reason why if you have a, a coin, like a penny or something, well, we don't have them anymore, but maybe you have one, you know, somewhere in the bottom of a drawer. If you, if you have a small coin and then you keep on dropping water on it, instead of spilling immediately, the water will form like a little dome, right? That's because water is able to stick to each other. And that's the, also the reason why when you have a plastic bag and it's wet inside, it sticks together. It's hard to open it, right? It sticks together. Um, that's also the reason why you can suck water up a straw. Right? It clings to each other. So when you pull one water molecule up, everything is going to go along for the ride. Okay? So it's because the molecule is polar. Overall, it's still neutral. Right? You have the same number of uh, 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 protons and, num and, and electrons, but then the electrons that they're sharing is uneven. It gets shift towards the oxygen more. That's why the oxygen is slightly negative. Anybody want to ask anything to clarify this? Um, I have a question, Professor. So um, oxygen becomes negative um, because they, it's sharing with two hydrogens. That's right. So in this bond right here, right, this, this line here, uh, mm -hmm. let me use a different color so there's no confusion. This line here represents electrons that are being shared. Shared electron. That's what the line is. That's what the bond is, okay? Shared electron. If it's 50-50 share, if the, if the oxygen gets the electron half of the time and the hydrogen gets the electron half of the time, then it's going to be no problem. Then there is going to be no negative, no positive. But for reasons we're not going to go into, the oxygen is pulling the electrons towards itself. So the electron is hanging around the oxygen more than it's hanging around the hydrogen. And that's what causes it to be slightly negative. Uh, two other questions. Wait, first of all, does, does that answer your question, uh, Mivir? Yeah, that's, that's okay. good. Thank you. And then why do we call it hydrogen bond? Uh, again, it's just some chemistry stuff. We're not going to go into it. Um, but hydrogen bond is an important concept that, we, that will come back um, throughout the lecture. Right? For us, hydrogen bonds just means, this is not entirely correct, but for the purpose of biology, hydrogen bond just means when a slightly positive part of one molecule is attracted to the slightly negative part of another molecule. Okay, this, this attraction is called hydrogen bond. Okay, and it involves hydrogen. Okay? That's like the very bare explanation of why it's called hydrogen. Okay, why do you say slightly when saying slightly negative or positive? Okay. <laughs> yeah, because it's not actually negative. OK, if it's actually negative, then that means you have an extra electron. OK, if it's actually positive, it means you are missing an electron. OK, so it's not like that. The water molecule did not gain or lose any electron. It's just that the electrons that are being that are in the molecule, they are not distributed evenly. Right? They hang around the oxygen more and makes it just a tiny bit, slightly negative. Does that answer your question, Samina? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, go ahead, uh, Tosh, do you have a question? Yes. Um, so the polarity of the water molecule, mm -hmm. um, so we can determine the polarity uh, depending on how the molecules are connected. 
That's right. But again, that's that's more chemistry stuff uh, that you will learn later. Okay, uh, we don't need to know that uh, for for biology. But you're absolutely correct. Like based on the shape, based on the you know chemical property of each of the atoms, you can figure it out. That's right. Okay. Thanks. All right. Uh, enough of that. Let's move back to our PowerPoint here. Now, water is very important. We cannot survive without water, right? For more than three days, right? Um, uh, three or four days, okay? We, we need to have constant uh, intake of water. And um, one of the reasons why water is so important is because it is a good solvent. Okay? You can dissolve a lot of stuff in water. Right? So if you're unfamiliar with the concept of solvent, think of making Kool-Aid. Okay? So you have a pack of these sugary color powder stuff okay that's the stuff that you will add to the water to make the uh fruit punch right i guess so this solid stuff that's the solute okay and the water that is doing the dissolving that's the solvent and afterwards you have a solution solution so in the body your blood is mostly water Right? And it's acting as a good solvent for many things, right? Your electrolytes, your sodium, your potassium, right? Your proteins, all those things are going to be dissolved in your blood, in the water. Okay? So solute plus solvent equals to solution. Not everything can be dissolved in water. Right? Things that can dissolve in water, that will dissolve in water, we call them hydrophilic molecule. This is an important term that we'll keep on using, hydrophilic yeah. molecule. Hydro means water, philic means loving. These are water-loving molecules. They will dissolve in water. Okay. Many things that are polar can be dissolved in water because water itself is also polar, right? Like dissolves like. If they're the same kind of stuff, you can mix them together. Right? So salt, NaCl, is hydrophilic. Okay? Uh, I don't know if you remember, we talk about a lot of stuff. Uh, you probably have watched some of these when you're studying, but sodium chloride, right? That's that's salt, right? And uh, the sodium chloride was formed because the sodium gave off the electron and the chlorine picks it up, right? So that makes the sodium positive and the chlorine negative. When you put sodium chloride, when you put salt in water, from experience, you know it's going to dissolve, right? So here we have a chlorine, we have a chlorine atom. I'm just gonna draw it again here because this 3D ball stuff, it's hard to visualize. I want to ask you, okay? I wanna ask you, what, what part of the water will surround the chlorine molecule? Is it A, the hydrogen or B, the oxygen? Let's do a poll. Uh, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. yeah, let's do the poll. Don't tell me the answer yet. <laughs> Sorry. I just want to share the answer to everybody. What part will surround the glory? Is it the hydrogen A? Choose A if you think it's hydrogen. Or B, oxygen. If you're not sure, you can choose C, all right? That's okay. That will tell me something as well. Just a couple more seconds before I close the poll. All right, thank you for participating. Uh, most of you got it right, right? And, and it's, the, it's the hydrogen. That will surround the uh, chlorine because opposite charges attracts each other, right? 
Uh, and the hydrogen is the part that is positive. So when you have a chlorine atom, which is negative, the slightly positive portion of the water molecule, the hydrogen is going to surround it. Similarly, when you have the sodium, which is positive, now they will be surrounded by the oxygen part. And so that's why salt is hydrophilic. You are able to dissolve it in the water, okay? Someone else give me a, an example of another hydrophilic molecule. What else can dissolve in water? Sugar, that's good. Yeah, sugar can be dissolved in water, right? Okay, so sugar is also hydrophilic. Anyone else have one more maybe? All right, that's fine. What about uh, things that cannot dissolve in water? Does anybody have an example of something that will not mix in water, will not dissolve in water? Oil. That's right, oil, right? Um, vinegar actually will mix with water, okay? Uh, so vinegar is hydrophilic as well. Uh, but oil, butter, right? Any kind of fatty stuff is not gonna mix with water. You put it in water, even if you try to shake it, eventually they will separate, right? So things that do not uh, dissolve in water, we call them hydrophobic. Hydro is water. Phobic is like the word phobia, right? To be afraid of something. Right? So hydrophobic means water hating or afraid of water. So molecules that do not dissolve, right? They are nonpolar and um, they are called hydrophobic. Okay, we just have a few more chemistry stuff uh, before we move on. Last concept, last chemistry concept before we go back to biology is the acid and base, right? So uh, when you have a liquid, we can measure the amount, the concentration of hydrogen ion in it, okay? So H plus, that is a hydrogen ion. It's an hydrogen atom, but it lost an electron. That's why it becomes positive, right? And so how much H plus, how much hydrogen ion do you have in a solution? That's going to determine whether it's acidic or basic. The more concentrated the hydrogen ions is, the more hydrogen you have, the lower the pH, the more acidic is going to be. Okay. So this typically is when the pH is below seven, okay, that's acidic. When you have less hydrogen ion, that will make your pH higher, and that is going to make it less acidic. Okay, less acidic is called more basic. Okay, so this is when pH is greater than seven. Okay, if it's equal to seven, then it's neutral. Okay, pure water is neutral. Less than seven, acidic. Uh, a big greater than seven, basic. So and what seven represent as a? I'm sorry. What does a seven represent here? Seven means it's neutral. Okay, so seven is right in the middle. Okay, the, the pH scale goes from one to fourteen, actually. So seven is right in the middle and it's gonna be neutral. So uh, things that are acidic, uh, those tends to be uh, citrusy stuff. So lemon juice is acidic. Uh, orange juice is acidic. Vinegar is acidic. Uh, you have acid in your stomach, right? Um, anybody know the name of the acid in your stomach? Bile. Uh, bile. Good, good, uh, good guess. Um, bile <laughs> is uh, is in the liver. Actually, uh, it helps you break down fat. Um, 
hydrochloric acid. That's right, hydrochloric acid. That's correct. So ferric acid is a. Uh, it's in your car battery. Uh, we don't have that, but again, good try. We have the hydrochloric acid in our stomach. Like we carry a bag of acid with us. Um, it's so strong. Uh, look here, right? Hydrochloric acid is so strong that it dissolves everything that you eat. Okay. Um, so that's the acidic stuff. Tomatoes, they are acidic. All right. Milk is slightly acidic, contrary to what most people think. Um, basic would be um, on the other hand of spectrum. These tends to be like cleaning products. Okay. So like, um, you know, ammonia, uh, baking soda, which you can use to clean as well as bake stuff. Right. Um, if you have a uh, what do you call that? Like a heartburn, right? You take some Tums, right? The Tums is basic, right? To neutralize the acid in the stomach, right? Um, so those are those are basic things. Bleach. Yeah? Human blood is a little bit basic, okay? It's about 7.35 to 7.45. Uh, 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 so just slightly above seven, okay? In fact, this number is very, very critical. If it goes just a little bit below 7.35, then you would have acidosis. You don't have to know these words, okay? Acidosis means too much acid in the blood, right? That could send you into a coma. Um, alkalosis is the other way around. When you have too much, um, the, the pH is too high, okay? Slightly greater than 7.45. So there's a very narrow range, 0.1. Uh, of a difference on the pH um, in the blood that is uh, compatible with life. Anything that's too high, too low, the body is going to um, have problems. Uh, and, uh, you know, your, your, your lungs, your breathing will change if it's too acidic or too basic um, to try to bring it back to, um, to normal pH. You ever vomit so much from like food poisoning or something, right? When you vomit a lot, you're actually losing a lot of acid, okay? And then you might notice your breathing pattern become very rapid and shallow, right? Uh, while you are having that episode of vomiting, right? That's actually your body trying to rebalance the pH of the blood. Right? Your urinary system will also change, right? If your blood is too acidic, you will pee some of the acid out. Your, then your urine becomes more acidic, vice versa, right? You also have these things called buffers in the body that would help um, balance out the pH, uh, you know, we drink orange juice and okay? that's going to, that's going to drop your blood pH, but we don't slip into a coma every time we drink orange juice, right? That's because we have buffers within the blood that would directly neutralize these acids, but they, they, they have limits. They're not going to work indefinitely. Okay. And if there are drastic changes, then you, you might be in trouble. Okay. Uh, that was a very, very long, uh, introductory lesson. Um, uh, I apologize for that, but uh, let's see if uh, if you if you if you get some of. Can you just things. go back briefly for one second? Sure. There we go. Do you have a specific question from this slide or something? Oh, you just want to copy the stuff down? Is that is that why? Yeah, that was it. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So remember, you have these PowerPoint slides, right? It's uh, all on e Centennial. Just FYI. All right, let's uh, do a quick poll question here. Uh, can you please read out the question because because of the poll I cannot see. Oh, it's blocking it. Yeah. Uh, sure. The water molecule is polar because, and then there are a bunch of choices. Um, I'll close the poll in a couple of seconds, and then we will. Uh... Yeah, if you're doing this on the phone, right? It's like the poll might actually be blocking the question. Maybe next time I let you guys read the question first before I uh, bring the poll up. Uh, in any case, the correct answer is um, C, right? It has an uneven distribution of electron. That's the, that's the core reason behind it, right? The oxygen is being 
pulled towards the oxygen more, the electron is being pulled towards the oxygen more, that's what causes it to become uh, polar. Okay. All these other things are true about water molecule, but it's not the reason why it is polar. And the reason why it is polar is because of uneven distribution of electrons. Moving on. The biology stuff now, okay, macromolecules. There are four main macromolecules in the body. Okay? We have carbohydrates, which are like grainy stuff, right? Uh, potato, rice, pasta, all those are examples of carbohydrates. That's the main source of energy in the body. We have proteins, which we can get from consuming meat um, or nuts if you are um, vegetarian or vegan. Uh, lipids and nucleic acid. So these are the four main kinds of macromolecules. Uh, we probably only have time to talk about carbohydrates um, today. So macromolecules are big molecules. They are molecules that have thousands of atoms in them, uh, as opposed to like water molecule, which only has like three atoms, right? So these are really, really big molecules. And uh, for the most part, they are considered as polymers, okay? Uh, uh, and, and, and each of these polymers are really, really long, um, and they are composed of smaller subunits called monomers, okay? So the best way to imagine this uh, is this, okay? Like you have these individual monomers, they are like, you know, those beads, right, that you use to make a necklace. And you can chain them together in a chemical reaction. And you would have your polymer. Okay. Individual monomers come together to form polymers. The monomers could all be the same. Okay. Or sometimes they have subtle differences. When I think about making the necklace again, right? You can you can make the whole thing using red beads, which is fine. Or you can use it using a uh, assorted number of colors. Right? So they might be the same or different, the monomers, but you can chain them together to form the polymers. So each of the polymers for the macromolecules have different names. Hey, don't worry about it now. We will learn them as we go through them. This is just like a summary chart. So carbohydrates, we call them polysaccharides, and the monomers are monosaccharides. We connect the monosaccharides together to form the polysaccharides. Okay. So more on that uh, when we get to the individual molecules. So how do we actually connect them together? The chemical reaction that connects the monomers together to form the polymers, the reaction is called dehydration synthesis. Okay. Or sometimes if you read like all the textbooks, they're called condensation reaction. Okay. So, as the name implies, dehydration involves the removal of water molecule. Okay, so here we have one monomer. Don't worry about what the hexagon is at the moment. I'll tell you that later. Okay, But this molecule has an OH on it. This molecule also has an OH on it. And in the dehydration process, you will remove H2O. Right, so you take the OH from one, you take the H from the other, that creates water. You dehydrate the molecule, and now you form a new bond. Okay, So that links the two monomers together. Okay. If you want to break a polymer, and your body needs to break down the polymer. When, we, when you eat the pasta, the rice, right? The, those are in polymer form. And your body must break it down back into monomers so that you can absorb it. 
So that is called a hydrolysis, which is on the next slide, but I want to complete this diagram for you. So to connect them, we do dehydration synthesis. You remove a water and connect them together. And when you want to break the polymer, you do hydrolysis. Hydro means water and hydrolysis, uh, uh, sorry, hydro means water, lysis means to break. So hydrolysis is to break a bond by adding water. Uh, Tosh, your question, dehydration synthesis is not boiling something. You don't, you don't have to boil, boil it. You, you are chemically removing a water molecule from it. So you take the H and the OH, and, and then you get a water out of it. Okay, it's not physically boiling it to vaporize it, right? That's not what it means. Okay, so here we have a polymer. We can add the water molecule and split the bond, and then you will get the monomers back. Okay, so again, you can chain them together by removing water molecules, or you can break them by adding water molecules. So let's see, I'll read you the question. There are two monomers shown below. We have uh, a hexagon with an OH. Again, don't worry about what the hexagon means. It will make sense in a bit. There is a hexagon with an OH. There is a pentagon with OH. Based on your knowledge of dehydration synthesis, which of the following would be the product when the two monomers are joined together with dehydration synthesis? When I put these two things together by removing a water molecule, which of these would be the expected result? Okay, I'll give you a moment to decide what to choose and I'm gonna launch the poll so it doesn't cover up the answers. Okay, hopefully you have decided. Please let me know what the right answer is. All right, anyone else? Uh, just last minute guess. Okay, very good. Thank you again for participating. A lot of you got it right. Um, it's gonna be B, B is the right answer over here, right? because you're gonna, you're gonna have the Pentagon connected to the sorry, the hexagon connected to the pentagon, right? Not two pentagons together, right? We're trying to connect this guy with this guy, right? That's why it's this. And you have to have the O in the middle because you're only removing a water molecule, which is H2 and then O, right? So there's still one O that's remaining. That's what connects them together. Okay. I hope that makes sense. All right. So let's start on carbohydrates, um, some basic information about it. When we go through these uh, macromolecules, you wanna pay attention to what kind of atoms it's made up of um, and you know its functions as well as the kind of monomers it's made up of. So here, uh, carbohydrates are organic molecules. All of them are organic because all of them contains carbon, okay? Um, but carbohydrates, it contains carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And it always exists in this particular form. CnH2O-N, so one part carbon and one part water. That's why it's called carbohydrate. Hydrate is referring to the water. Don't be uh, bothered by the N too much. Let's say N is six, right? Then the formula is C6 and then H12, because six times two is 12, 
and then O6. That would be glucose. That's the main uh, preferred form of carbohydrates for your body. The one that you burn to create energy. Okay, so uh, that's basically carbohydrate. All carbohydrates will follow this form, right? And can be like 10, could be like 20, right? Whatever the case is. We need carbohydrates, as I just told you, for quick, short-term cellular energy. When you move your hands, right? Uh, that requires energy. To talk, that requires energy. Any kind of movement requires energy. Where do you get that energy from? You are burning glucose from your body. You're burning carbohydrates, right? The glucose is a kind of uh, carbohydrates. You're burning that to provide the energy for it, okay? To keep yourself warm, you need to keep on burning things, right? So all those things are uh, 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 requires carbohydrates. So that's the main function. Carbohydrates can also form structural components in plants as well as some animals. Okay, we don't we don't do it in in animals uh, in our body, but for things like um, celery sticks, right? They're crunchy because they have carbohydrates that forms the fibers in them. Uh, shelled animals, the shell contains a specialized form of carbohydrates in some cases um, to. Um, uh, 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 to provide structural support, okay? Uh, like if you take um, like supplements, some of, some of you might take glucosamine, right? It's a common thing that people take to strengthen their uh, joints, for example, right? That's, uh, that's a special form of carbohydrates uh, and it's actually extracted from, uh, from seashells, from shells of uh, shell, shellfish, I should say. So this is the overall reaction um, that our body used to produce energy. Right? You take a glucose and you burn it basically with oxygen and it produces carbon dioxide that we breathe out as well as water and it produces energy. Okay, don't worry about memorizing the equation now. We, we're gonna have a whole lecture on this later on, okay? But just for now, right? know that this is called cellular respiration and, and it's the main process for creating energy in your cell by burning glucose, which is a form of carbohydrates. Where do we get carbohydrates in our diet? There is no shortage of carbohydrates, okay? If you live in um, a developed country, right? Uh, in, you know, North America, like Canada, for example, no shortage of carbohydrates. Uh, there are good kinds and then there are not so good kinds. Okay, So generally speaking, when you have a proper meal, right, you should have some uh, starch from a meal. right? So that could be from rice, from things like corn, wheat, potato. right? If you want healthier choice, you can have some quinoa. Right? That, those, all of those things are carbohydrates. Right? Uh, fructose is another kind of um, carbohydrates. Uh, they, they are found primarily in fruits, right, in the, as the name implies. But you can also find them in artificial form like corn syrup. Lactose, um, you will find it in dairy products like milk, cheese, yogurt. Some people, of course, are uh, allergic to lactose, right? Uh, not allergic, but like lactose intolerant. Um, although some people are actually allergic to them as well. Sucrose, you will find it in uh, your kitchen. Uh, the sugar in the kitchen is actually sucrose. Uh, uh, a candy bar, uh, like I said, tape, table sugar, all that stuff. Right? So no shortage of carbohydrates. Like on a daily basis, we probably consume way more carbs than we uh, than we supposed to. So remember the uh, carbohydrates, it's a polymer because it's a macromolecule, right? And as with all polymers, they are made up of individual building blocks that are called monomers. Okay? So the glucose, fructose, and galactose, they are the key monomer of carbohydrates here, okay? Uh, and, and collectively, they are called monosaccharides. Saccharides mean sugar. Mono, in this case, is single. 
You don't have to memorize what they look like. You don't have to draw them. Um, I'm just showing you what they look like. Okay, so the glucose, which is C6H12O6, right? In fact, they are all the same formula. They're all C6H12O6, but they are just connected differently. Sometimes they connect to form a hexagon. That's what the hexagon that drawing was, right? Sometimes they connect to form a pentagon, okay? Uh, and then this is also a hexagon, but the arrangement is a little bit different. And so we have the glucose, we get the fructose, and we got the galactose. These are the building blocks for carbohydrates. So let's take a look, right? We can take a glucose, the hexagon, right? And then plus a fructose, the pentagon. And we connect them using dehydration synthesis which means we're going to remove a water molecule. Okay, so you take an H from the glucose, you take an OH from the fructose, you remove the water molecule, and you end up getting a sucrose, your you know, kitchen sugar. So this, with two monosaccharides joined together, we call it a disaccharide. Disaccharide. Okay, you don't have to memorize what it looks like, but you need to know which two connects together to get what. Okay. So we have a couple more here on the next page. If you take a glucose and you connect it with an other glucose, you will get maltose. Next time you eat a granola bar or chocolate bar, candy bar, look at the ingredient list on the back. You will almost always find maltose. Glucose plus galactose, that's what gives you the lactose found in dairy product, right? Milk, ice cream, yogurt, cheese, lactose. They all have glucose in it, right? But depending on which one you combine with, you get different kinds, right? So glucose plus fructose gives you sucrose. So these things over here, those are the monosaccharides. And then these over here, those are the disaccharide. Okay. Now that is unfortunately uh, times up for the lecture. Uh, we did do quite a bit today though. Okay, so like, you know, obviously go through, um, you know, the stuff that we went through. And I just want to remind you, especially those of you who came in late, right? No Zoom meeting next uh, uh, next class, no Zoom on Wednesday. I will post the recording for the rest of the lecture, okay? I will also post an additional recording uh, of me taking up the, uh, the study guide, okay? Uh, I, I will also post just the answer. If you don't need to hear me explain this stuff to you, you just want to check the answers, you have that option. But I'll post a, like an old recording of me taking up the whole um, uh, study guide as well, okay? So you have to, you must, you must watch the recording on your own, okay? I'll make it available later today, All right? So you watch it and you learn lecture two uh, on your own, basically, by watching the recordings. Uh, do the study guide. Those should prepare you uh, well enough for the uh, for the quiz, which is on the 24th. Okay, I'll post the information about the quiz as well. Uh, no class next Monday. College is closed. Uh, but I will be available on email. If you have any question at all, just email me. But one thing, though, when you email me, please let me know you are from my online biology class. Okay, I teach other courses as well. If you just randomly ask me what's on the quiz, I don't know which class you're from. I can't give you the right information immediately. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for coming, guys. Uh, uh, have a fantastic week. And next time we meet on Zoom will be on May 24th. All right. Take care. Have a good one. Bye for now. Thank Bye. you.